Ever since I was a small boy, I've been fascinated by obscure things. Things like chukbol, a version of handball that's very popular in Taiwan. Airlines like Miat, the Mongolian airline. Countries like Sao Tome e Principe. Now, is this just a geeky love of trivia? Well, partly it is, yes. But I've turned this boyhood love of obscurity into a career, into a career in research, into a career as a sociologist. And in my career as a sociologist, I've researched a couple of main areas. One is the global extreme heavy metal music scene, which was the subject of my PhD research. And this is the underground, transgressive, darker form of heavy metal. Only a few of its um, stars are well known. The other area where I've done research is on the British Jewish community, which is just 0.3% of the British population. Now, these are quite small worlds. And as you can imagine, there aren't many people researching the British Jewish community or the global extreme metal music scene. So having written a couple of books on the subject, I'm something of an expert. <laughs> but it's something, but it's no great achievement to be an expert in these two small fields. In fact, I'm what you can call, in the English phrase, a big fish in a couple of small ponds. In fact, I'm an even bigger fish in an even smaller pond. I am, and I think I can say this without fear of contradiction, probably the world's foremost ex uh, expert on the connection between Jews and heavy metal. <laughs> I have a blog called Metal Jew, th <laughs> through which other Jewish metal fans contact me. Now, needless to say, I'm not going to become famous through being this biggish fish in a, such a tiny pond. But there's something serious going on here as well. Tying all these interests together is an interest in small worlds. I love small worlds. I love researching them, and I love participating in them. But what are small worlds? Well, we know them by a number of names. Communities, scenes, subcultures, groups. Small worlds are spaces to which people devote their lives, to which they find meaning. They're often obscure, there are millions of them, and aside from family, friends, and the workplace, they constitute one of the main areas where life is lived. But outsiders are often unaware of them, and their importance is often underestimated. Now, for my latest book, I've been testing out a hypothesis. This hypothesis was, is, that I could choose a small world anywhere in the world at random without knowing anything at all about it, go there, and I would find interesting and fascinating stories. And moreover, I'd find commonalities between these small worlds and between the metal scene and the Jewish community that I know so much about. And this is how I've started. By investigating the Luxembourg water skiing scene and going to meet the best water skier in Luxembourg. Now, this whole thing started because it's something, it started as a joke I used to tell about myself. Because I'm an expert, but in a very small field, I used to say, well, I'm just like the best water skier in Luxembourg, without actually knowing anything about the Luxembourg water skiing scene. But I turned this joke on its head, and last year I went to Luxembourg, a country of under half a million people, with eight water skiing clubs, seven of which are on the Moselle River, which forms the eastern border with Germany. And yes, I met the best water skier in Luxembourg. But I also got much more. I got stories of passion, even of heroism. And in the future, I'm going to be visiting more small worlds that I know nothing about. Later in October, I'm going to be going to the Channel Island of Alderney, off the coast of Britain, to meet the top politician on the island. I'm going to be going to Iceland to meet the special forces who, who are, and I'm not making this up, called the Viking Squad. I'm going to be going to Botswana, hopefully, to investigate the Botswanan heavy metal scene and find the top heavy metal band in the country. I'm going to be going to Suriname, hopefully, and meeting the top novelist in the South American country. And finally, I'm going to be going to Malta to investigate 
Malta's favourite soft drink. <laughs> now, all this sounds fairly frivolous, but there's something really important here. Small worlds are powerful. Small worlds demonstrate the power of the small. Leopold Kaur, in his book, The Breakdown of Nations, said, where something is wrong, something is too big. E.F. Schumacher, in the book of the same name, famously said, small is beautiful. Smallness is human. Smallness is accountable. Smallness is non-alienating. Smallness is convivial. And above all, smallness is livable. The anthropologist Robin Dunbar has postulated a number of around 150 as the maximum number of people that a human being can hold a meaningful relationship with. Now, whether that exact number is right or wrong is not really the point. What is certainly true is that we can only develop a relationship with a tiny, tiny fraction of the world. We are always within a small world to some extent. Yet, we're also living in a world that's dominated by bigness. Big corporations, big celebrities, big stars, big countries, big brands. And these big things dominate our world, smothering some of the heterogeneity in it, imposing their wills on the rest of us. They treat our big world as if it is their own small world. Small worlds, in contrast, represent the hope of diversity, of heterogeneity, of difference. They are all wildly different from another. But yet, as my research I think is showing, they also have certain things in common, whether it's the Luxembourg water skiing scene, heavy metal scenes, or Jewish communities. One thing they have in common is passion, commitment, meaning. You could be at a medal concert, or you can be a Jew praying at the Western Wall. And what you're drawing on is something very similar, the power of togetherness, the power of being part of something bigger than yourself, but not too big. And we all need a home in this big, bewildering, often dangerous world. And that's what small worlds offer, whether that home is a metal scene or whether that home is a Jewish community. But more than that, small worlds offer places where individuals can flourish and where they can achieve more than they would have achieved on their own. Here's a picture of a couple of uh, geniuses in small worlds. Chuck Schuldiner, that's the guy on the left, uh, a death metal guitarist who founded almost single-handedly the genre of death metal, battling against poverty and commercial indifference for most of his life till he died tragically young a few years ago. The person on the right is Jonathan Wittenberg, a British Jewish rabbi with a devoted following who is not widely known outside that world. But more than individual genius that flourishes within small worlds, we also get what Brian Eno calls seniors, the collective genius of scenes, the collective genius of small worlds that makes them more than just the sum of their own parts. But there's a dark side too. Small worlds aren't always wonderful places. They're sometimes riven by stress, by conflict, by schism. Indeed, the conflicts within small worlds can sometimes be worse than the conflicts between small worlds. The Jewish community is riven with conflict over religion, Israel, and much else. In the medal scene, the person on the right, Varg Vikernes, in the early 1990s, killed a rival musician within the Norwegian black metal scene in the early 1990s. Small worlds can also become repositories of power, hierarchy, and conservatism. One way you often find this is in the position of women. In some Orthodox Jewish communities, women spend their lives pregnant for most of the time and covered up from head to toe. In contrast, in metal scenes, women are often treated as scantily clad sex objects. And people who have power within these small worlds have a vested interest in keeping it that way. Now back to the Luxembourg water skiing scene. 
one of the things I discovered there was that there was a golden generation of Luxembourg water skiers who achieved great things in the 1960s. In the 1950s, a few close-knit families built their own equipment and started water skiing in isolation from the rest of the world. But in the early 1960s, they discovered to their surprise that they were world beaters. Sylvie Hulseman, shown on the left, won the World Water Skiing Championship in 1961. The person on the right, Jean Calms, won the European Water Skiing Championship in trick skiing in 1962. They were a golden generation, a tight-knit family living in a small world. Unfortunately, it didn't last. In the 1970s, there was a major split in the Luxembourg water skiing world, and the Hulsman family and the Kalmus family fell out over the future generation that the scene should take. And it le even led, for a time, in to two rival national water skiing federations in Luxembourg being formed. And the Luxembourg water skiing scene faded back into obscurity and mediocrity. Nonetheless, there were still diehards who kept the faith, who kept going. The man in the picture is Jeff Biddinger, probably the best water skier in Luxembourg today. He's in his early 40s, and despite the fact that Luxembourg, uh, water skiing has been waning in Luxembourg for a while, and the fact that he's quite a way down the world rankings, he still pushes himself in the various water skiing disciplines. He still teaches people. He's still devoted to his club. Moreover, there is a whole new generation of wakeboarders, which is a related sport to water skiing a young, dynamic generation who are revitalizing the scene, who are bringing new people into it, who are forming a new national team that may yet stun the world. Small worlds like the Luxembourg water skiing scene are both resilient and fragile. So what should those of us outside small worlds do? Well, we have to recognize the tension between making uh, small worlds open to the world and potentially dissolving them through that openness and being closed and walled off and potentially shriveling and dying. We need to look at the big picture, which is, yes, we need to look at big themes. We can't dissolve our world into a plethora of, right, uh, of small worlds. But how do we do that? How do we retain a sense of the big picture while supporting small worlds? Well, there are a couple of things we can do. One is to cultivate curiosity and also critical friendship. To be curious about what people do in small worlds, but to be friendly with them, but in such a way that we don't always accept everything that happens within them. For those inside small, world, uh, small worlds, people need to start thinking, how can I change the world by changing my own small world? How can my small world be a laboratory for, th for ideas and practices that could change the world. Now, I'm going to end this short talk with a challenge for all of you. I'd like you to discover the pleasure of discovering and researching small worlds. So I'm going to set you a challenge, which is to investigate a small world in Poland that I know absolutely nothing about. I've chosen it almost at random. And I want you to investigate that world and get back to me via my website, and we will collectively crowdsource a ch uh, th this challenge. So that small world is, are you ready for this? The Polish baseball scene. I want people here to find out everything they can about baseball in Poland. And there are two caveats, two provisos. One is, I don't want people sending me translated versions of websites in Polish about baseball. That's too easy. I want people to meet Polish baseball players face to face. I want to know who the key players are. I want pictures of them. I want to hear their voices. The other, ca uh, the other caveat is these can't be expat Americans here from the embassy who are playing baseball in their spare time. Again, this is easy. I want Polish-born baseball players. And I've had a brief look online, and they do exist, but I don't know much about them. So are you with me? Are you going to take on this challenge? Yeah. I said, are you with me? Are you going to take on this challenge? So be in touch with me via my website. And if you want to know more about the best water skier in Luxembourg, that's also on the website. Thanks very much for your time.